Well, 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 well. Hello, everyone. It's going to be a great video today. Uh, you need to watch this video. Watch it to the end. You're going to love it. Uh, we're going to talk about secret reasons for the crusade. Uh, we're going to talk about the why Giza is as it is, what the ancestors of Giza were, and why it's what, what the shape of a pyramid comes from. Uh, all this is derived from Druidic knowledge in relation to pre-spherical world conceptions. I'm so happy about this video. So uh, do watch to the end, tell your friends as well. So firstly, let's explain, shall we? So uh, you're going to love this. So in the Norse tradition, we know that there is heaven, earth, and neverworld, or heaven, atmosphere, and earth in some aspects of that tradition. Um, there is a, uh, a Vedic tradition, which is very similar to the Norse tradition, which is basically this. And that is called the Triloka, or I imagine tri -lo three location tradition. And that is basically, we'll call that Norse tradition. Then the second aspect of Hindu tradition, we've seen the first aspect, which is similar to the Norse tradition, is the old story of the world uh, in the shape of a, uh, the world as a turtle. And I imagine that is because the vault of heaven looks like a, a turtle's back. They would be looking for something in nature, something around them, which resembled what they were seeing in the physical mineral world. And which I, I assume was either a turtle, which ha carries a hemisphere, a tortoise, or an elephant, which, which looks similar. So the tradition began to arise that, oh, the earth is uh, on the back of four elephants. Or, and they're standing on another turtle, and it goes down forever. And, um, and of course, if that is the case, then you have a pole, do you not? And that is the origin, possibly, of the totem pole. So basically, what we're seeing is the origin of the totem pole itself. The totem pole is the universe and is the tree. And we've shown in earlier videos that the, the on the totem pole that the big giant is often placed on the bottom. Hey, I'm the giant of hell. The little giant in the middle, I'm a human. And another little giant on top, but he's got a crown saying that humans can become the gods in, in Asgard. Or he doesn't have to have a crown. It's just three giants or a triple god. And the triple god is king of the stone ages. And... Um, now we see the Great Pyramid origin because a staff god is being turned into a pyramid. And we're about to see that in a second. But uh, it says the Great Pyramid is replacing us totem poles because the Great Pyramid like this must represent Earth slash Northern Hemisphere. And uh, Stachini, who didn't know about this, that, you know, we're just discussing for the first time ever in this video and in other earlier videos on my channel, um, didn't know why... The Earth seems to represent the Northern Hemisphere, but uh, that's the conclusion he mathematically came to following off the ideas of Newton, which I have not been able to, to locate the origin of those, those so-called um, Newtonian thoughts. There must have been scribbles in a book somewhere, but anyway. Uh, and now we, we look at the Pacific Northwest World Tree, and it's more of a Hindu Eastern kind of thing with the birds often on top, and then animal, 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 animal stacked. Uh, just like, say, um, the, the stacking here, which goes on for an infinite series, possibly. And with the, the on top of world tree is the bird. That's why the bird is on top of the American totem pole. Which means that the totem pole is the whole universe. So, let's look further. This can also be drawn as... The world tree is stacked hemispherical vaults. So that's a, a tree of the world. Um, now, here we have the elephants and they're saying something. So the elephants are saying, we four elephants hold up the vault, the four corners of the world in Eastern tradition. And there are some interesting words which are related to vault. Vault and world seem to me to be the same, almost the same word. So is vault the actual origin of world or do they have a common ancestor? The elephants are holding up the world very well. And they are very valuable elephants indeed. 
And uh, the Velt is also a uh, South African word for flat plains. And of course, there are who, what, where, we, and why. Two of them, we and where, sound like world. So world is we, and world is where. Where is it? Where? Where in this vast world? And in the conception, the Norse Indian conception, or more the Norse Aryan conception, we can see that by dividing the world into three parts, we actually have the volatile mercury, we have the, the solid sulfur, and then we uh, the solid salt and the hellish sulfur from deep in, deep within the three alchemical components of every substance. Uh, in addition, and this is so good, the birds are speaking. Look at that. They're saying we birds can fly almost to Asgard and are identified as the sacred female. And the birds, of course, are perched on top in American con uh, uh, versions of the totem pole because this is a tree a tree shooting right through the middle of this earth disc up into Asgard and that's important that it's going through the middle so Maria Gimbutas uh, a fame a very famous and very neglected prehistorian uh, identified something in prehistoric Europe that is pre-2000 BC called the staff god basically a four-faced stick and old Europe is not just Europe, but she drew it on her map as including Egypt and North Africa. And the fact it included Egypt, North Egypt, gave me the clue about the pyramids. So I actually speculated that the four-faced god actually became a pyramid. And that was in my book, In Search of the Origin of Pyramids. Now, a, uh, a colleague called Petr Yandatsek, I've mentioned him a few times. He's written some excellent papers, which you can read for free online. He told me about this thing called the Basque Lauburu, which is that. And he said, it looks like four elephant heads joined at the trunks. So a, a cross is actually a way of uh, describing a, a picture of the universe. So therefore a cross, the origin of the cross is explained uh, in the Stone Ages. And therefore the Celtic cross is kind of similar. Is it again for elephants and, and therefore the staff god, another pyramid type representation now it seems in the stone age world it was thought that to survive as above so below so a nation a country must be a microcosm of the world slash vault slash tree it's all the same thing isn't it therefore a country had to have a world center or it was not a country and we see this all around the world in the Stone Age. Okay, no one's talking about this. So, you will remember from previous videos. Oh, and by the way, omphalai seems to be womb phallus. That is where the word comes from. What else would om be? It's womb phallus. So, in the Indians, uh, the Indians show, for example, a, uh, a, a, a phallus in a river. You know, that's their god. And that is a, a womb because there's waters of creation around it. So anyway, I found a map, which you know of, and it looks vaguely like that. A map of UK from the 1200s, written by a, 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 an English chronicler who wrote something of an encyclopedia of history, um, the Chronica Majora in the 1240s, 1250s. And in this work is contained a very interesting map, which shows England kind of as a rectangle with a bit of Scotland projecting up to the north. I have to switch off that fridge and what I he put, puts London right down there and what I noticed is he puts Salisbury almost in the middle uh, which is Stonehenge and then the implication is what's in the middle and you know about I think about 16 miles or 16 kilometers north of Stonehenge is Avebury and he does not mark that in so he doesn't know why he's drawing England the way he is so he's copying an earlier map and Avebury, the greatest, uh, the cathedral of, of prehistoric Britain, is in the exact centre of this map. So it is a omphalos of England, a snake monument. And we see these all around the world. Where the snaky, uh, the snaky rivers meet in Egypt is the Three Pyramids. Um, uh, we see a, a central location at, 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 at Nazca or Sacsayhuaman uh, relative to the length of the South American continent. Um, 
Newgrange, it's, it's not really in the centre, but it's kind of, you could, you could call it in the middle of the economically productive part of the country because it's close trading-wise to England and it's kind of omphalos of Ireland, sorry. USA, what's the omphalos? Is it the Serpent Mound? Is it Poverty Point? I notice both Poverty Point and Newgrange seem to have a natural amphitheatre and if you want to take me up on that, um, there's a book called The Checkered Lights of Newgrange and there's a, there's a, the bloke who wrote that has found a lot more to Newgrange, including a laser light show and amphitheatre nearby, than the archaeologists have realised, because the archaeologists have tunnel vision. They look at just the stones, nothing else, just the, just the monument, nothing around it. And, of course, Mullumbimby in Australia, another snake monument, um, which is being rediscovered, but unfortunately it's been demolished, and actually houses are about to go over the top of it. So let us zoom in and see what's going on. So the Romans uh, actually carried down an ancient tradition uh, where they uh, actually explained the midnight sun and the night time using this hemispherical model. So uh, what they did was they, uh, they saw, um, here's the earth as the disc, the ocean around it, and basically around this or around the whole thing are mountains, right? So they saw the sun as rising in the sky and setting. And then what happened was it actually went behind the mountains to the north on its way back. And this cast a huge shadow over the land, resulting in night. And, um, uh, you know, funnily enough, they used to teach this. Um, so so uh, apparently uh, my... Uh, uh, granny or great granny was telling my father this model of the world in uh, in remote Poland in the early 20th century that the sun sets in the swamps and and it's you know it, it, like a kind of stone age tradition of a flat earth and that is what is responsible for the sun being visible in the northern countries at midnight because it's actually down there and it's very low fascinating fascinating so um I identify three map-making traditions in the Middle Ages. So firstly, let's look at the new map-makers. These are the people who were trying their best to, to find what the Earth is really like. So Ptolemy, the famous Saxon map, the Roman maps, maps used by Columbus, and the Valdez Müller maps, and many others used by traders, explorers, merchants, etc. And these were very accurate maps. They wanted them to be as good as possible, and they were mainly new maps, brand new maps. Then we have a tradition which seems to go back to the Stone Ages, the monastic tradition. And if you look at uh, mon what monasteries and chroniclers and monks drew of the world, it's totally different to how the new map makers were drawing the world at, at the, exactly the same time. And this arose out of ancient tradition. Look at the Pomponius Mela map, and it shows a cartographic version of what monks drew centuries later. So this goes all the way back. Medieval maps go all the way back to the ancient world. So um, they, they sort of show the earth like a kind of cake divided into four or three parts. Earth in alchemy, that's what it looks like, and the four elements, or three elements sometimes. Now, this is kind of how they drew the monks through the world. They would uh, draw Europe, Asia, Africa, and guess what's in the middle? Jerusalem, connecting all the continents together. And this surely arose from Druid tradition, with something in the middle as an omphalos and a disc, a flat disc. And you see some maps like this from the 1500s, and they seem to show extra islands here, and you don't know what the islands are. And I think they must be American islands. And, and all the, these maps are from the Middle Ages. They must be American islands. Because if you want to put America on the map, where do you put it? You can't. You have to put it here, off the coast of Europe, because that's how you get there. In addition, um, so these are found in Monk's Chronicles. Countries are depicted on a flat circle. Earth is divided into quadrants or thirds. Sometimes it's like this. So that's Asia, Europe, Africa. Asia being bigger. So that's how they show that it's bigger. It's like two continents in size. 
So they thought, oh, this must be true because it's too perfect not to be true. The same reason we love relativity because it's so perfect or love any theory because it's so perfect. So they couldn't get rid of this theory. So uh, did the center used to be Giza? That's what I'm asking you because Egypt is a kind of connection between the continents. You want to, you want, you want to go to Africa, how would you do it? Well, if you're in Europe, you might go uh, stop in Egypt and go from there. Or to get to Asia, you'll stop in Egypt and, 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 you know. So that is a hidden reason for the Crusades capturing the center of the world or the womb phallus. Because medieval monks looked in their chronicles, looked at Jerusalem and said, Oh, I, well, why shouldn't we capture the center of the world? Right? So how important would that be? And now we come to a third wild card of ancient map, medieval map drawing, and that is the lost tradition of the ancient sea kings. So in a 1300s book called the Secretum Secretorum, and I had an argument on Twitter with someone called Annie XT, and he reckons it's made up by medieval Arabs, but I don't think so because it says the sons of Seth once had, that is the sons of a descendant of Adam, once had all the knowledge of the world, but everything was lost and only partially recovered by Greeks, Arabs, and Christian scholars. And we see, we have seen so much evidence of this on this channel. I've presented to you so much evidence of this lost worldwide empire and other channels as well. Uh, Brian Forster talks about ancient high tech. And what really got me going was that the Piri Reis map, which is so accurate from the 1500s, shows Africa and Spain cut off from something else. And the, all, the, all the Greek maps, all the Greek maps, bearing in mind the Greeks seem to have uh, arisen in power just as soon as the Orichalcum trade with America ceased, seem to show half of Spain and the west coast of Africa absent. There they are on the other half of the map. So what actually happened was they seem to have possessed a world map in very ancient times and this has been bisected. Part of it was ignored and became the Peri Reis map, cutting Spain and Africa off. And the other bit became the Greek maps of the world, which kind of show a rounded, a rounded sort of world, a rounded sort of countries, uh, with, uh, with, uh, uh, with, with these bits absent. So they draw Africa like that, you see. Just incredible. Thank you. Stay tuned for the next video. It's going to be amazing.